Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to talk here at ACAMP. Uh, my favorite topic, of course, is vitamin D, and I've been talking about vitamin D for the last 10 years. So I've um, written lots of articles on it, and I'll be talking about vitamin D and the innate immune system and barrier function, and then I try to get into the autoimmunity as well. That's a whole lecture on its own. So, so my disclosures, really I have no commercial interest, and I do, don't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, there are a couple little errors in the, in the slides which I'll point out for you. And before we get going, uh, the Institute of Medicine suggests that if we use uh, 600 international units of vitamin D a day, we should be getting enough to, for all of the things that we need in our body, especially for bone health between the ages of 1 and 70. Is that true? I'm not entirely sure, but I will try to explain that a little bit. In this talk, I'm going to be talking about um, the international units, which are nanomoles per liter, rather than the nanograms per liter, which they use in the U.S. If you want to convert them, uh, you should write this value down. Uh, you have to divide the nanomoles per liter by 2.5 to get the nanograms per liter. Now, the safety margin as well for the IOM has been increased from 2,000 to 4,000 international units of vitamin D. And that allows us to do studies safely uh, on higher doses of vitamin D. When we look at what happened in Canada, as we had a recommendation from the Canadian Osteoporosis Society suggesting that we uh, use 800 international units of vitamin D in those over the age of 50. So who's right? If we even step back a little further, the Canadians have far better recommendations from their uh, societies than, than the Americans. The Canadian Pediatric Society actually recommends 2,000 international units for those who are pregnant. There is no such recommendation in the States as far as I know. So that's considerably more than 600 international units. The Canadian Cancer Society also recommends 1,000 international units for everybody that's in Canada. It could very well be that they recognize that we live at a higher latitude and we just don't get as much sun and need a bit more. But looking at all these three recommendations, you can see the IOM has got the lowest recommendation. When we look at our area, Edmonton, where I come from, uh, the percentage of population that has less than 80 nanomoles per liter at any time of the year is 67%. We did this study on 1,400 patients in our area, and uh, when we looked at and broke it down, people with dark skin had far less vitamin D, so did pregnant women, and the levels were uh, much more inadequate during the winter time. 80% never made it to 80 nanomoles per liter. Is 80 nanomoles enough to do the things that we need in the innate and in, in the immune system? I'll talk about that, and I believe it is very inadequate. So when we look at age groups, too, as well, we find that uh, the younger people have the lowest vitamin D levels. Seems like people, when they get older, they start getting worried about osteoporosis and start supplementing with a little bit of vitamin D. So our young people have the lowest levels. They sit in front of the computers and, and they have their thumbs working hard on little game machines that they have and they don't go outside and they don't get the sun like they used to. This is a very busy slide. Uh, most of this I talked about during the pre-conference uh, session. Where do we get our vitamin D? What does it do in the classical pathway with bone health? What does it do in other cells in our body? We're just basically going to limit ourselves to the grayed out ones, the light gray ones on the, uh, would be on your, on your uh, right hand side as you're looking over there. Uh, so we're looking at it, what it does for barrier function, innate immune system, and adaptive immunity. So we do require a lot of vitamin D for healthy immunity. It provides us with strong barrier function. It uh, induces antimicrobial production. It uh, produces hydrogen peroxide and monocytes. And lastly, vitamin D can prevent an overaction of the innate uh, immune system, uh, I mean the adaptive immune system. 
this, uh, this article that, that comes from, you can get on ResearchGate, just like Dr. Janice. I have all my articles posted on ResearchGate, so you can look them up there. Uh, when you look at the innate immune system barrier function, the epithelium is what protects us from invasion, from infection and injury on the outside. It is also the first line of defense against the bacterial, viral, and fungal-laden environment that's outside of our body, and it protects the relatively sterile internal environment of the host. So what genes are upregulated with a vitamin D? Well, the tight junctions are, the gap junctions are, and the adherence junctions. So your entire system works better when you have adequate levels of vitamin D. What levels of vitamin D do you need to have the best uh, results for this? Well, it's closer to 100 nanomoles per liter. When you're looking at that antimicrobial peptide immunity, um, the antimicrobial peptides can defend us from the bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And the production of cathelicidin and some defensins in the body are dependent on sufficient circulating 25-hydroxy-D. Uh, what about vitamin D in de uh, cellular defense? Well, thirdly, hydrogen peroxide secreted in monocytes gives you an increased phagocytic burst potential. And another thing that these chemo Toxins do that vitamin D produces, it attracts other things to repair things in our body. So, and lastly, in the uh, adaptive immune system, we find that vitamin D prevents an overreaction and an inflammatory response. So it actually decreases inflammation here and increases uh, things in in the other part of the system. So, it also reduces. Uh, uh, suppresses the production of excessive tumor necrosis factor and IL-12, which are really pro-inflammatory. So vitamin D also has effects on the function of our T cells. Vitamin D has direct effects uh, on T and B cells, and activation of T cells increases vitamin D receptors, and these increase fivefold after a cell activation. Vitamin D reduces the T1 cytokine production and induces, reduces the IL-2, the IF and 1, and the increase in IL-5 and IL-10, leading to an increase of the T2 dominance. When it comes to B cells, vitamin D is a potent inhibitor of the B cell antibody secretion and autoantibody production. And when we saw in the last lecture, that seems to increase as we get older, and uh, T2 dominance would be better. The other effect is, that is on the macrophages, vitamin D promotes the induction of monocyte differentiation to macrophages and modulates the macrophage response, releasing uh, inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Second, when we look at the pathogen recognition uh, in our body, uh, we are able to pick up the uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns on the surface of our cells. These are essential polysaccharides and nucleotides that differ a very little from one pathogen to another. They're not found on the host. They are relatively invariant, whereas if you look at uh, your H1N1, of course that's variant, and you find that that varies quite a, quite a bit over the years, and that's why the flu shot is always uh, different from year to year. <clears throat> 